Well, good afternoon, and I'm very excited to be here with Danny Bressel, who is, uh, I first met him at a Right to Learn conference many years ago. Uh, he's actually written some things for our uh, state journal, and uh, I'm just very excited to have him here today. I'm going to say a little something about what I found on his website. Danny Brassel is a cross between Jim Carrey and Robin Williams. And if you don't walk away from his seminars with ideas you can use tomorrow, then you are unconscious. And I have to agree with that assessment. So uh, I'm, I'm going to start by asking Danny to tell us a little bit about his background, and then we'll move into some questions. So Danny, I'm going to shut up and turn things over to you, and it's all you. Tell us a little bit about that background. Uh, or should I say Jim? I don't know. Okay wrong <laughs> <laughs> well thank you so much thank you so much for having me sam i really appreciate all the joy you're spreading that's my mission is to bring joy back into education and workplace uh you know i i believe communication is key and there's four aspects of language development that all your listeners know about those are speaking listening reading and writing and so i've set up my various uh, businesses around those four elements so in terms of writing I've written 17 books. My latest one uh, was uh, Bringing Joy Back in Education. Actually, I just finished writing one this last week, so it's going to press very soon. I'm very excited about it. Uh, and I can't tell the title because it's a really cool title. Uh, <laughs> in terms of speaking, I still speak uh, over 100 uh, dates around the world. I've spoken over 3,500 audiences worldwide. I absolutely love uh, getting all everybody all pumped up. Uh, in terms of reading, I have the world's top reading engagement program online, which in just over two months shows parents how to get their kids to read more, read better, and most importantly, to love reading. Because you and I were talking earlier, I always tell people, I think schools do an adequate job of teaching kids how to read. But the question I always ask people is, well, what good is it teaching a kid how to read if they never want to read? I teach kids why to read because I've never had to tell a kid, go to turn on the TV, I've never had to tell a kid, go play a video game, and I never want to have to tell a kid, go read. I want them to choose to do it on their own because they love it, and they're simple strategies I share with parents and teachers alike to get kids all pumped up about reading. And then finally, what I've really been focused on a lot lately is uh, I work with uh, people on creating well-crafted stories that will help them engage audiences to take the next step, whether that's to purchase their product or to donate to their cause, or if it's a teacher, how do you sell a lesson to those students uh, at, at Well-Crafted Story uh, workshops? Uh, so I'm just really uh, delighted. You can take me any direction you want. <laughs> okay, well, the first direction I'd like to take you is, I, I, you know that I am an incredibly strong advocate of the joy of reading, and you've got to send me the link to that new book, by the way, to, to make sure that that gets where people can get to it. Um, and uh, you've done, an, I know just recently, you've done a number of a podcast around that topic of the joy of reading. And, and I'm looking there, uh, and, and I believe that purple book I see in the background there is your new book. Is, I, will, uh, I, will, I will send you a copy, Sam, afterwards. Uh, yeah, this is bringing joy back in education. It's not explicitly about reading, but it does talk. I mean, anybody who listens to me, you're going to have to hear about reading because I, I, I think there's plenty of readers that become that not may not necessarily become effective leaders, but I've never read about an effective leader that's not also an avid reader. So reading is my passion and um, it's ironic because I grew up hating reading. My father, <laughs> my father was a public uh, librarian and I always hated the public library. It always smelled funny to me. There was uncomfortable furniture. There was always an elderly woman telling me be, to be quiet. There's always some freaky homeless guy hanging out by the bookshelves who thinks he's a vampire. And it wasn't until I started teaching in the inner city in South Central Los Angeles where I saw a lot of my students didn't have the advantages I had growing up. And I basically said, shame on me. I mean, I was blessed, Sam. Both of my parents were in the home. We were poor, but we always had uh, food on the table. And my parents always read in front of us kids, to us kids, and we had plenty of access to reading materials. And so uh, it's really been a passion of mine to to spread that joy uh, to others. Okay, I, I I am going to send something your way uh, about Julius Anthony's um, uh, Believe Project. Uh, I just want you to be aware we've got good things cooking in, here in St. Louis. But now let's get into the nuts and bolts of things here. If I'm a teacher or a parent, and, and this is like a two-parter, and I'm going to let you just run with both parts, 
Um, what can I help uh, those? Uh, what can I do to help the students uh, have reading become that joyful uh, experience? And what are things that uh, you can do to help students develop lifelong habits of reading? And I know there's your five star program and your leadership book about motivation or all, all the rest. But uh, so give us the nuts and bolts now. I've got teachers out there and uh, some parents wondering, what can I do to do what you're saying to do? Bring that joy to reading. So nuts and bolts, please. <laughs> yeah, so I've been blessed. I've taught all age levels from preschoolers all the way up to rocket scientists. I can make that claim because I used to teach English as a second language to engineering students at the University of Southern California. And what I learned is what works with a 12th grader doesn't necessarily work with a kindergartner. But what works with a kindergartner works with all age levels. <laughs> when I was a middle school teacher, I was the only teacher in the school that didn't have a single tardy student. And the reason was because I'd always start off class by reading aloud a Paul Harvey story. I don't know if you're as old as me, Sam, but... Uh, yeah, you know, I think older, actually, but go oh, ahead. <laughs> at this point, you pop off my head and you count the rings. But I grew up listening to Paul Harvey. Every day he'd come on the radio at 12, 15. He'd be like, I'm Paul Harvey with the rest of the story and for five minutes he tell you a story and you're trying to guess who's the person he's talking about or the company or whatever and my my kids absolutely love those stories but the problem with those books there's four of them they're all out of print you can still get them on amazon though uh each of them has 101 rest of the stories my students loved them but a lot of those stories are about people like sears and roebuck well today's kids don't even know what sears roebuck is and so the leadership begins with motivation book you were talking about that I, I wrote. This is basically an homage to Paul Harvey, where it's updated with people like Jeff Bezos and Elon Musk. And it was kind of interesting, Sam, because when I finished writing the book, I actually read the book and I was like, huh, completely unintentionally. Most of my examples were of white male Americans. And so the book that I just finished writing last week is uh, stories primarily of women, minorities, and international. It's actually the most fun I've ever had writing a book. Um, so, and you're going to have this problem with me. I, I, I tend to give long answers to short questions. Uh, that's so a for, good thing. <laughs> yeah. For teachers, you got to find out what kids are interested in. When I was teaching second grade, I had a, a boy, Kiara. And Kiara's first grade teacher told me, Kiara don't know nothing. I'm like, well, thank you for that. Well, Kiara, who don't know nothing, comes into my classroom one day. And he's like, and this is a long time ago. He's like, hey, Ms. Bissell, you see Barkley last night? He had 18 points, 16 boards. I'm like, thank you, Kiara. Because from that day forward, every day after lunch, I'd sit Kiara on my lap. We'd read the LA Times sports page together. And wouldn't you know it, by the end of the year, Kiara was my best reader in class, and all that kid ever read was sports. But I, I always make this point to parents. The little boy who only reads Captain Underpants is going to become a better reader than the little boy who refuses to read anything. Captain Underpants is the gateway drug to Shakespeare, but you got to get the kid hooked first. You know, it's one of the, the things I see. This is kind of just a theory of mine. I mean, when I was teaching the little ones, I, you know, I, I think it's like 96% of kindergarten through second grade teachers are female. Um, and then they just assume if you're a guy teaching little kids, you're either a pedophile or you're homosexual. I'm neither of those things. I just didn't <laughs> I actually love teaching little kids. They're great because they don't know what they can't do yet. And my theory is that you get a lot of women teachers and they're reading books that they loved growing up, which I totally encourage people to do. You read aloud your, your favorite books, you read them in a different way. But the problem is... Uh, it's illustrated in one of, I don't remember which one, but in one of the Diary of the Wimpy Kid books, I love it because Greg Heffley's mother decides she's going to start a mother-son book club. And so she invites she invites all the boys from the neighborhood to come bring a book to her mother-son book club. And the books that she's brought are like Sarah Plain and Tall, Little House on the Prairie, Little Women, uh, you know, uh, Anne of Green Gables. And the boys have have brought like How to Cheat at Video Games, Dinosaurs, Monster Trucks, The Book of Bodily Functions. And I'm like, that's what reading is to little boys. I, I was so pleased. Um, There's a friend of mine who invited me to, a, I, we went to a football game last year and he had another friend with him and his, his friend had two sons that hated reading. He's like, well, is there anything I can do? I'm like, well, what do the guy, what do your boys like? He's like, oh, they love uh, 
they love monster trucks and stuff like that. I'm like, well, take them to the library, get them monster truck books. He's like, yeah, but that's not what they really read in school. I'm like, no, 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 no. Get them whatever they want to read. The more they read, the better they'll get. So we went to another football game this year and he showed up. He's like, oh, I'm so glad you're with us, Danny. I just wanted to tell you, you're a genius. My boys are reading like crazy. Every every Friday, they beg for us to go to Barnes and Noble so they can buy comic books and Marvel books. And that's what reading... That's what reading needs to be. It needs to be this fun thing. And I, I think that that's what too many people, I was with a fourth grade teacher and she told me, Mario don't know nothing. I'm like, well, Mario, thank you for telling me about that, about Mario. He doesn't know how to read, really. I was with Mario for an hour and Sam, in an hour's time, Mario must have texted at least 15 people. He sent several emails. He was surfing the web. He's highly literate. She is using a definition from 75 years ago. And so like when I'm working with parents, one of the first strategies I always share with parents is President Bush Sr. signed a very important law in this country over 30 years ago that said every television set in America has to have closed captioning. So the first strategy I share with parents is turn on the closed captioning. And they always look at me and they're like, well, wait a sec. If the show's in English and the subtitles are in English, what good does that do? I'm like, well, that's a fair point, but let me make a point. Have you ever watched a show with subtitles and not looked at the subtitles? It's actually very difficult to do. Your brain is actually drawn towards the text and there's actual research to support this. If you look at reading scores around the world, the more kids watch TV, the lower their reading scores are in every single country on the planet, except for one. The country where kids watch the most TV has the highest reading scores in the world. It's Finland. And people always ask, well, how can that be? I'm like, well, because Finland makes really bad TV shows. And so what they had to do is they import all these old American sitcoms like Welcome Back, Cotter and Happy Days and Good Times. And they're all subtitled and finished. The kids are constantly reading. It's one of the easiest strategies I share with parents all the time. I'm like, hey, turn on the closed caption. I mean, the entire foundation of my reading program for parents is based on two numbers. These are very important for the audience to hear. The numbers are 67 and 20. So... A lot of people say it takes 21 days to change a habit. To those people, I like to ask, show me the research on that one. It's a completely fabricated number. I know exactly where the number comes from. It comes from a wonderful book written in 1960 called Psycho-Cybernetics by Dr. Maxwell Maltz. Now, Dr. Maltz was a plastic surgeon, and in the preface of his book, he said he noticed it took most of his patients 21 days to get used to their new face. Well, a lot of personal development, self-help gurus, a lot of people I respect, by the way, they started telling people it takes 21 days to change a habit. That is a complete nonsense number. Well, in 2009, researchers at the University of London did a habit formation study, and they determined it took anywhere from 18 to 254 days to change a habit, and the average was 66 days. Well, I don't like the number 66, so I throw in a bonus day. 67 days to change a habit, and it actually depends on the habit you're trying to form. So, for example, if you want to drink a glass of water before breakfast, that might take 18 days. But if you want to quit smoking, that could take 254 days. And this is why this is important, Sam. Let's say you go on a diet, you follow it religiously for 21 days, but then you fall off the wagon on day 22. Well, you blame yourself, which is wrong, because the research is showing that on average, it takes at least three times longer than that to form a habit. So the first number is 67. The second number is 20. Now, researchers were trying to figure out what are the... The, the similar characteristics of successful students around the world, they stumbled upon something that completely flabbergasted them. The number of minutes spent reading outside of school. So they looked at the low kids, the average kids, and the high kids. Starting with the low kids, the, uh, the kids in the 20th percentile, F students, some of your worst students, they average less than a minute a day reading outside of school. That didn't surprise anybody. It's probably why they're at the bottom of the class. But the next number did surprise the researchers. The kids in the 70th percentile, middle of the class, C students, your average students, they average 9.6 minutes a day reading outside of school. So when I'm doing a live parent training, this is when the room gets really quiet and the first parent raises their hand and says, wait a sec, are you saying if I can get my kid to read 10 minutes a day, I can take him from an F to a C? That's exactly what I'm saying. There's actually over 200 different studies that have demonstrated this. But uh, one, next... I'm going to stop you right there and ask yeah. you, say that again, because I, I just want the, everybody to hear that again. Uh, say that yeah. again and then continue. 
<laughs> yeah, so there's over 200 studies that have demonstrated that number. So this is all. I, if you want an opinion, you know, go talk to your uh, brother or your sister. You want you want uh, a fact. I'm going to give you research. I think everything should be based on research. I never understand why people just throw out these obnoxious ideas. I'm like, there's no research to support that idea. So there's lots of research to support this idea. But the next number blew the researchers away. The kids in the 90th percentile. We're talking some of your top students, A minus students. Do they spend three hours a day outside of school reading for fun? No. Do they spend one hour a day reading outside of school for fun? No. The average was just over 20 minutes a day. That is the entire basis of my program is where can we find those 20 minutes in your single day? And there's two things you need to know about. First of all, being, first of all, the, the, the minutes don't have to be consecutive. So you can do three minutes here, two minutes there, which is great. I always tell parents, you know, if it takes you 10 minutes to drive your kids to school each way, you know, every day, just put in an audio book and listen to it back and forth to school. You just cover your 20 minutes. And that leads to the second point, being read aloud to is just as powerful as reading on your own. Uh, you know, I, I'm pretty sure you have this experience too, Sam. We work with a lot of dyslexics. Dyslexia is a reading disability and you have to understand all reading disabilities are curable. Dyslexics tend to process information a lot better with their ears than with their eyes. And so when I'm working with dyslexic students, I always am giving them lots of audible books. I, I think everybody should, should listen to uh, audible books. But if you look at, you know, some of the most successful people in the world are dyslexic people like uh, Sir Richard Branson is dyslexic. Tom Cruise is dyslexic. George Washington was dyslexic. It's not something to to worry about. It's something that you can get help. There are people that can help you. And it, it's it's a different ability. I've never liked the word disability. It's just a different ability. It's it's your special ability. Um, and so those are those two numbers. Sixty seven. My program is designed in just over two months. We're going to create a reading habit to get your kid to get excited about reading because the more excited you are to read, the more likely you are to read and the more you read, the better you get. So there's your, uh, your 10 minute answer to your 30 second question. <laughs> no, that, that question required that 10 minute answer. And I'm very glad you went into depth around that. Okay. Uh, I, I'm going to kind of get ready to wrap things up, but before I wrap things up, I, I want to give you one more shot at that, uh, creating joy. Um, uh, and also, um, I know there's some late, lately there's been some things, uh, people like Mark Seidenberg, who is very famous for being SOR, and uh, he uh, has recently talked about what I call uh, SOR 1.0 uh, and said, wait a minute, uh, we may have just overdone it. Uh, we... Uh, Yes, you need that direct, explicit instruction uh, early on in the process, but, and this is a direct quote from him, the purpose of reading instruction is to enable students to achieve escape philosophy, which basically say, saying, um, yes, you start with that strong, explicit set, but then you move to that implicit set, what I sometimes call creating that self-extending system and getting the kids uh, to use all these different uh, reading skills and knowledge and language and let them develop that um, basically in implicitly on their own. So uh, that's a lot. Now that was a long question, <laughs> but I, your reaction to that, do you, uh, you know, I'm a seeker of common ground. Uh, is there some common ground here? Do, uh, there is. I, I, I don't even understand. I, I commend him on that. On saying that, I love that. I love people that, as they get more information, they they change their opinions. I mean, we go. You and I have been in this game for a long time. Education always is this seesaw. We go to the extremes, but if you want the balance, you got to go right to the middle. I mean, do you need? Is it important? I mean, you got some people over here believe the way you teach a kid how to read is ah, ah, alligator, but ball kick kick cat because that's the way we all s -s -s speak you know and then you got the people over here that believe the way you teach a kid how to read is okay sam i want you to take this book home put it under your pillow and when you wake up you'll know how to read i'm being facetious we know that uh you know you need a you know if a if a kid needs some help with the blends i think helping 
teach children blended, the blend sounds is very important. And if a kid loves sitting there reading on their own for fun, I think that's important. But we know, we know as educators, we need to have a balanced approach. And this is what I've also learned. If I, if I got a kid that sits there and loves doing phonics worksheets, what should I do? Give them phonics worksheets. If I got a kid loves sitting in the corner on her own reading, let her sit in the car. I mean, the school was built for them, not for me. We have to adapt based. I was just being interviewed earlier today, and the, the reporter, she asked me, well, Danny, what do you think, uh, public school or charter school? And my answer was yes. Some kids, it's public. Some kids, it's charter. Some kids, it's homeschool. Some kids, it's magnet school. Some kids, it's vocational school. There's no one simple thing that works for everybody except for my program. Uh, you know, it's, it's always about the program. You and I have been in this game for a long time. But I, I actually, I really commend him for saying that, that he's he recognizes that, hey, wait a sec, maybe we went a little bit overboard. That's great. What a mature comment. I I applaud him for that comment. And I would I would hope both sides would stop this is, this is a problem in America. People go to extremes and they demonize one another. And I, I think most of us are really somewhere in between rather than one or the other. It's kind of silly to tell you the truth. Okay. Well, that's, that is so much music to my ears. Uh, my last question is simply, did we leave anything important out? Because this is your chance. Oh. If you left something important out, this is your chance to chime in. And if we didn't, we're going to wrap this thing up. Well, we're as a thank you, for, yeah, as a thank you for everybody listening to me, I want to give everybody a couple of freebies. So if you go to freegiftfromdanny.com, again, freegiftfromdanny.com, I'm going to give everybody a complimentary e-copy of my book. Read, Lead, and Succeed. This is a book I wrote for an elementary school principal who was trying to keep his faculty and staff positively engaged. So I said, okay, I'll write you a book. So every week I give you a concept, an inspirational quote, an inspirational story, a book recommendation on a book you should read, but you're probably too lazy. So I also give you a children's picture book recommendation, demonstrates the same concept. You read that in five minutes. I'm also gonna give everybody access to a five-day reading challenge I did online last summer for about 700 parents around the world, where every day for an hour for a week, I give you all kinds of strategies to get your kids pumped up about reading, because we've been talking about this. The more excited we get kids to read, the more likely they are to read. And the more you read, the better you get. You get all that at uh, freegiftfromdanny.com. And I just want to congratulate you for being our, our soldier out there, uh, Sam, showing everybody the joy of reading. I, I just support everything you do, and I hope you keep on doing it. Thanks for having me. Okay, well, the, the final thing in a Bomberito interview is kind of, it's a little silly, but you ha you, you've, you've had that big smile the whole time. But I need the big smile and I need a wave because you are going to do a Zoom wave goodbye. And thank you so much. It's been delightful.